Good evening, everyone. This is Alyssa here with AOP Tech, and this is our edited Google Forms uh, elementary webinar from Wednesday, February 15th, 2017. And today we're going to take a look at utilizing data with Google Forms, all the ways that we can use Google Forms in our classrooms and, and as professionals as well. So Aaron and Bill are, always, as always, our co-hosts for the evening um, for our AOP Tech webinars. You can follow them on Twitter uh, for even more AOP Tech tips, tricks, and resources and information. So just a little bit about our agenda this evening. I uh, want to share with you in just a moment the archive and Act 48 information, and then we'll jump right into our presentation. So uh, first and foremost, the archive of this webinar will be on our YouTube page. Know that in about 24 hours time, so about this time tomorrow evening, you'll get a, an email from the GoToWebinar platform and it will have the resources and everything from our evening and looking at Google Forms here, which is fantastic. Uh, our YouTube page is the host for all of our AOP Tech uh, webinars, uh, their archives, as well as a whole host of other videos and tutorials. So there, it's a great resource for you to check, uh, to take a look at different Google apps, tutorials. There's also app reviews and tutorials on there and all kinds of tips and tricks uh, from Aaron and myself. Also note too that for Act 48 information and purposes, that registration was separate from ours at the, on the AOP Tech, our department side. That registration is on courseware. You'll need to fill out the evaluation form on Courseware when it's posted as well uh, towards your Act 48 credit. For those who, who met those requirements and signed up for that, anyone is always welcome to our AOP Tech webinars, whether they are taking advantage of that Act 48 credit or not. So today I am your presenter here. You're stuck with me a little bit this evening. Hope you don't mind too much. Uh, and I've met most of you at this point. And uh, if I haven't, it's wonderful to virtually meet you. And if I have, I'm glad that you're here and I hope we see each other in person really, really soon. So with that, let's jump right in to Google Forms. And I'm so excited to share with you about Google Forms today because it's truly one of my favorite tools. Uh, I use Google Forms for so, so many things. Um, if you've filled out any registration for AOP Tech, you've done it through a Google Form. Aaron, Bill, and myself, we, we live in Google Forms uh, some days there. So definitely something that you can utilize in a ton of different ways. So if you don't know how to get to Google Forms, um, the first thing that we're going to do, uh, or I should say, let's take a look at our agenda for, for our actual content here. So what are Google Forms and how can we use them? That's kind of our baseline ideas for everybody. Uh, how are we going to utilize this tool in the classroom? We're also going to have a walkthrough. And that walkthrough, we're going to look at all the different settings and features of Google Forms in there, as well as question types. And we're going to start to develop a sample form in there. Uh, the nice thing is, this is a really leveled webinar this evening. Uh, according to the feedback from our registration, there were lots of different levels uh, of comfortability when we came to Google Forms and for those who registered. Many of you are brand new to Google Forms, uh, which is great. I'm so glad you're here. You're going to love Google Forms. Uh, so really for you, that walkthrough, for my newbies, that walkthrough is aimed right for you because that's the first level. And I really think of this webinar as having some different building blocks in there. You know, we've got to crawl before we run kind of thing. So that walkthrough, that's my level one, folks. You are getting to, to build a basic form in there to get comfortable with utilizing Google Forms completely. My next level up from that is utilizing the quiz feature in Google Forms. So that was kind of the second 
uh, level of folks I saw when it came to use of Google Forms. Many folks indicated they had used Forms, but not the quiz feature, which was new for this school year. So that's my intermediate folks. That's your building block and next step up. We're gonna try it out and get some feedback in there and take a look at that feedback, how we might analyze, excuse me, analyze that data. Um, and that'll lead us to a, a quiz on Girl Scout cookies because who doesn't like Girl Scout cookies? So something to put us in a, a good mood on a Wednesday evening. And finally, we'll wrap up with some advanced user tips that focus really on the utilization of Google add-ons to enhance and customize your Google Forms experience. So something for everyone in this webinar, no matter where you fall on the continuum of utilizing Google Forms, whether that be you are brand new or beginner, we've got that walkthrough for you. Uh, intermediate folks, let's take it a notch up and try utilizing that quiz feature. For my folks who are really comfortable and do a lot, some suggestions for add-ons to really make a customized experience. So I hope that gives us a well-rounded view in a very short period of time on Google Forms. So my main objective this evening is that you leave this webinar with the confidence and knowledge to create a Google form to use in your own classroom, whether that's a beginner level or you're at that advanced level. Making that transition to from learning about uh, a tool to utilizing the tool in the classroom. So let's start with ideas for forms. And to me, the best thing about forms is that forms can be used for what Ever purpose you need. It is one of the most flexible tools that I have in my back pocket because I can really adapt it for just about anything. And that's what I like most about it and really speaks to me. Uh, I tend to personally like tools that are that are not unitaskers. I like things that are dynamic and that I can have some flexibility in them. So it doesn't matter the group of teachers or students that I'm working with, I can find a way for it to fit into my curriculum or into my professional life. Uh, the more tricks it does, the better. So some ideas for forms. Uh, in the classroom, what we're kind of speaking to tonight more specifically is quizzes and formative assessment. Um, it's a great way to do that. Uh, the last one on that list is that bell ring or exit ticket. It's a great place for teachers to start. If you have not used uh, Google Forms with your students before, um, a bell ringer and or an exit ticket as a piece of formative assessment is a fantastic way to get yourself going. Uh, it's a great way to record observations and have that background to go, or have that spreadsheet to go back to um, instead of having necessarily a clipboard where you're checking things off. Uh, a great Google form can really help you to monitor and track progress. The same with guided reading checklists or reading checklists, skills checklists. It really gives you the ability to have an easy way to input data into that form, and then you can go back to that form and the corresponding spreadsheet, which we will talk about in a little bit. Um, you can go back to that anytime from any device. So you've got all your data right at your hands uh, whenever you want it, and you don't have to worry about losing a million slips of paper or even just the stacks of paper that you might have uh, had to take around. Uh, several teachers, and this is one for my folks who are a little more comfortable in Google Forms world, I've seen many teachers use Google Forms as a rubric for themselves, where they had the student and some criteria, they check 4321, corresponding spreadsheet, then has that student's name and all of their scores there. Uh, a great way to streamline that process as well. And even collecting web-based assignments. I love using the multitude of web tools that are out there. And many of them give the students ability, the ability to share their work with an authentic audience or with you via a, a link. 
But if every one of your students had needed to email you, for example, a Prezi link, you could have 25 plus emails with just links in them, clogging up your inbox. And that's not um, very effective or uh, for, for anyone. Uh, it makes your inbox cluttered. Students are emailing you, did you get my link? Did this link work? And you've, it's just a mess. So I know some folks who use Google Forms where students have uh, the ability to have their name, their period, and then uh, or class number, and then they drop that link in. Again, this corresponding spreadsheet keeps it all streamlined and organized. Um, and that's a really beautiful thing. We as teachers, we love our organization. And Google Forms and the spreadsheet it correlates to really do help us to do that. Professionally, there are a ton of different uses for Google Forms in there. You can collect parent information that way. Um, I used to run into a frustration in the classroom where uh, parents one parent preferred email, where another parent preferred uh, phone calls, and sometimes I get bogged down in trying to remember or keep track of who preferred what. So at a parent night, you want might want to consider asking parents to fill out a short Google form with maybe some information about their child and their contact preferences. And then it's, again, easy to go back to. Signups and registrations. Uh, definitely something Google Forms can be used on a wider school basis for. Again, if you've signed up for anything uh, with AOP Tech, we most definitely utilize Google Forms as our main form of registration in there. But even something like a t-shirt order or a yearbook order might be able to be streamlined through Google Forms. I know many schools have uh, Christmas pageants and spring shows and you order everybody a t-shirt uh, which is fantastic uh, but you have to sometimes collect and correlate all those pieces of information Google form can help you do so um, and even school surveys whether that be that you're surveying the students in your class to help your your practice grow uh, or as a department or even parents. It's a, a great easy way to put together more of a survey. Even more ideas. Uh, and, and because it's so adaptable, we could go on and on. Students to submit links uh, the way they used to with Drop It To Me if you ever use that tool. Later on in my advanced portion here, we're going to talk about GMath uh, briefly in there. Wonderful for my math teachers, particularly at the middle school and up level. Fluberoo is another fantastic add-on for my advanced users who want a more robust self-grading assessment. Uh, a sign-in and sign-out sheet, which would be a great way to keep track of, you know, who used the restroom when, uh, things like that. Uh, flipped classroom video assessment. Google Forms allows you to fill in uh, or insert YouTube videos into a form. Great way to do some flipped classroom in there. Uh, a teacher shared with me that they used Google Forms as a book classroom book sign out. They had their class library, but particularly at the middle school level, when students are holding on to books longer because they're they're more novel based, you know, it was hard to keep track of who had what book. And they had a great Google form that they used that students signed in. And when students returned that book, they went into the spreadsheet and marked that it was returned. Peer evaluations, homework, discipline group work tracking, even self-reflection or self-assessment activity for students as we have them look more and more upon their work to identify their strengths and weaknesses, a form can help that. When you receive a copy of this presentation, uh, this more ideas right here is a hyperlink. It was passed to me uh, from Pete and C. Uh, one of our teachers who is on the webinar tonight was out at Pete and C, uh, as well as Aaron, Bill, and I were, and went to a Google Forms session that had just a ton of ideas on utilizing Google Forms in the classroom. So well-timed, and I thank them for sharing that with me. So I included that that with you today, for you today. Feel free to take a look at that as well. Has even more ideas. And, and you could go on and on with the ideas for Google Forms. And that's a great thing because it means it's a tool that isn't tied 
to just one thing. Each of us as educators have the ability to use it in the way that best suits our personal needs. So uh, now that we know that Google Forms are a survey tool and you can use them in a variety of ways, also this cool choose your own adventure uh, or scavenger hunt type form there, we know that. How do we get there? So there's a couple ways. I'm going to jump over to my drive. And I can get there two separate ways from my drive. I'm actually going to open up uh, one form here. So if I already have it in my in my drive, Google Forms saved to your drive. Think of your drive as your virtual filing cabinet. So if it's in your drive, you're able to select it, open and edit it. If I need to start brand new fresh, there's a few things that I can ways I can get there. First, I can use the blue new button in the top left hand corner of my screen and I can select new and it'll actually be under the more, it'll be that first one there, it's the purple icon, Google Forms. So I can launch it from the blue new button on the left hand side. I also have the ability to use the waffle or what Google calls the quilt up at the top right hand corner. And if I scroll, I'll have Google Forms there as well. So two places so far. Blue New from the, the quilt. And then finally, I can do so in a, in a tab. I can di type directly to um, forms.google.com. And I'm going to go there for a quick second because I do want to show you some of the templates that exist on Google Forms here. So if you go directly to the Forms uh, landing page by go typing in forms.google.com in your, in your URL bar, you're going to get directly to Google Forms instead of going through your drive. I personally tend to go through drive just because I always go to drive first. It's my ground zero. I always go back to it. I know it's going to have my stuff. So that's where I always start. It's just that's my personal preference. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's the only way or the best way. So forms.google.com and that way you can choose which method works best for you and your students. I love knowing that there's multiple ways to get to the same thing. So from the direct Google Forms, uh, I can start a brand new one, which I will in a moment. I can start a blank quiz directly, but I'm going to start with a plain blank. But there's also these templates here, and this is a relatively new feature. You can uh, browse the template gallery of Google Forms, and there's not a ton of them, but the ones they have are really great. And it's a nice starting place. All of these templates are totally editable, but they help you kind of, if you're new to forms and you're, you're feeling a little apprehensive about creating a form from total scratch, they can be a great way. There's already one for an exit ticket in there. So if I select that real quick, you can see it's got some information pre-filled in for it. And you know, I could go ahead in and edit these questions or or and whatnot there, but it does give me a, at least a starting place uh, if I was feeling a little apprehensive or really needed a quick shortcut uh, to to creating a form. You know, you kind of decide on the fly that morning, like, oh, you know what? That would make a really good Google form. You can really save you uh, some time. So there are a bunch of uh of templates in Google Forms. You've got your exit ticket, an assessment one, a course evaluation. Love this t-shirt sign up one for, for the uh, idea I mentioned earlier, RSVPs for events, uh, collecting contact information, event registration, things like that. So you do have a couple of really fantastic options in there um, and you get to those, you can access those by going directly to forms.google.com and it'll be at the top. It'll say start new form and all you have to do is select template gallery on the right hand side. But for today, I'm going to select a blank form because we're going to start from scratch and we're going to take a look at a totally blank form here. So first, I've got my blank form. This is what it looks like if you open one fresh and new. I'm going to label uh, this one Girl Scout Cookies. Here, and I'm going to say a quiz on cookies.
Beautiful. So that's just my title and description. Now before we go any further, I want to point out two things in the top left hand corner here. So first, you'll notice it said, was said saving and then all changes saved in Drive. This is cloud-based saving, much like uh, Google Docs and Drive and the whole G Suite there. So you've got that going for you right away. So that's always a nice feature in case, you know, God forbid you ever get the blue screen of death. Um, or something like that in there, your changes are saved along the way, or even if you just get pulled over from to a student uh, in the middle of working on something, you're working on it on your prep, and a kid comes in and you get pulled away, uh, you're saved in the middle there. Up here in the top left as well, it says untitled form. That's because I haven't formally titled it. I've given the form itself a title here where I've named it Girl Scout Cookies, but not in my drive. So if I clicked away now or I X'd out of this tab, in my drive it would still be listed as untitled form. I haven't named the file yet. Now if I've already filled in my title here and I click directly inside that box, it'll have, uh, it'll move the title over. I can edit it or add to it. When I click away, it'll save it there. Um, or you can name it first, but it is important that you definitely take a moment to click where it says untitled form in there. Otherwise, in your drive, you're gonna have several untitled forms. Um, and particularly important if you're making a similar form for several different uh, sections of your class, whether it be a sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, something like that, or to cross over different content areas so you don't have them mixed up along the way. So we're gonna take a look here up at the top right hand to take a look at some of our settings and what these icons mean. So first, I have this puzzle piece here for add-ons. We're gonna come back to the add-ons later uh, and talk about that. If you were to open your Google Forms right now and you didn't have that, that information there, that little puzzle piece, it's because you haven't added an add-on yet, and that's okay. We're gonna talk about that after. Next up, the little palette is your color palette. And you can change the color of this. One of uh, the more humorous emails I received once from, from a teacher was, the purple drives me crazy. Uh, and especially when they had it projected up on their smart board, I guess with the, the discoloration uh, of their, their board, and it drove them crazy. And they're like, can I change that? Yes, absolutely. Aesthetics are important. Maybe you want it, I'm gonna make this one green to match the Girl Scout cookies uh, kind of theme here. I also have the ability to, um, by clicking the picture in the bottom right-hand corner, I can get some different themes that Google makes uh, I could always match it, you know, use a science one to match to my science quiz, something like that. Also have the ability to use pictures from my photos, uh, from my albums that are in my drive. So if you've signed up for anything with AOP Tech, most often what I've done when I've created it is I've selected the, the Archdiocesan logo, and then I use that, and it kind of pre-fills in that, that look and feel there. Next on the list here is the preview button. It looks like the little eyeball, and I'm gonna select that, and you'll see it'll open up a new tab, and it will show you what the form will look like to the respondents who are taking the form or participating in the form. Um, so right now, you can see there's not a lot because I haven't filled in much on my form yet, but if uh, I had a lot more, I'd be able to see it, and sometimes that's a nice self-check for you to go back and take a peek uh, at, you know, just how advanced or what it looks like to the person who's going to take it. Now to the, to a big important one, this gear wheel, which is your settings. So we're going to look at the general and presentation settings right now, then we'll come back to that quiz feature there when we move up kind of our next level. So under general, we have a, f a couple of options. And you can see I opened a blank one because I wanted it to show you the full default um, settings that are on a Google form because there's one that's gonna be important that depending upon your audience, you're gonna have to change. So first and foremost, you can decide whether you're gonna collect folks' email addresses when they um, fill out the form. And there's, 
pros and cons to each of these depending upon what your ultimate purpose is or depending upon who your audience is. So collecting email addresses does require uh, folks to, to sign in to uh, an account, whether that be in your domain or otherwise. Um, so if I'm sending that in to if I'm sending my form, excuse me, to a group of parents, I actually keep this unclicked because I don't know what kind of email they have. I don't know what I don't want to make it more difficult. Instead, what I tend to do, no matter what, whether it's parents or students, if it's not an anonymous uh, setting or survey or registration form, um, I make name uh, and email address the first two pieces of information folks fill out on forms almost no matter what. And I do that purposely as just the complete safeguard. Um, so that way I always have that to go back to and I try to make that my personal best practice. Uh, so that way there's never any question, whether that be students or educators or parents, whomever the form is going to, uh, I always do that. Uh, one of the comments, um, that I've heard from from a teacher was that when their students do it, they always, 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 whether they have students sign in or not, have students fill in their name, the class period, the subject, their email address. And that's the start of every form for that teacher. And I thought that that was really fantastic because then there's never any question of who filled out what, because that's the that's almost impossible if you don't have some kind of identifier. Um, and you and you don't have them sign in, it's almost impossible to backtrack to tell who filled out uh, what pieces of information. So you'll also see the next require sign in. And this is another really important one. Restrict to the Archdiocese of Philadelphia Office of Catholic Educator Users. Well, this is my domain. The, the AOP uh, Office of Catholic Education, that's my domain. Uh, when you go to yours, it'll if you're on a G Suite account, it'll say restrict to uh, St. Uh, St. Joseph St. Robert's domain or whatever the, the domain name is for you there. If you're only utilizing this within the school community with students who have accounts on your domain, it's fine to restrict to that. It will require them to sign in. I know some schools who like that because then it means other people can't get in and invalidate surveys or whatnot. But if you're intending anyone who doesn't outside of your domain to participate, to view anything with this form, you're going to have to unselect it. So anytime I send something out from AOP Tech, that's my very first thing I have to do is make sure that I've unchecked that requirement and I'm gonna do that right now. Same thing with limiting to one response, it does require sign-in, pros and cons to all things. So again, it can be really flexible and adaptable to whatever your needs are there. We want to also decide whether respondents can edit after their submission or see summary charts of the responses. And these can be good and bad, again, depending upon the purpose. So edit after submitting might not be so great if you're asking students to take a piece of assessment and you don't want them to go back and change their answers in there because you want to get some raw data. Um, might be a good idea if there's brains, you know, there's a form that has to do with brainstorming and they want to be able to refresh that. Uh, the summary charts, again, if you're looking for some raw data, you might want, want to students to see what others have responded. Um, or if you're just doing an anonymous poll, it could be cool for them to see and watch along the way all the results tabulate and post in. So you have that flexibility really based upon the needs of your community and the the form that you're using. So feel free to to play with those settings and really adapt them as you need them. So right now these are going to be my settings for our sample one here. I'm going to click save. I'm actually going to go back in but I like to remember to save all the time. 
My second one, presentation. Presentation is just going to be how does it look to your respondents? Uh, will it show the progress bar? If you've ever taken a longer survey for like a company or a store, you'll see like page one of three, whatever the case is there, uh, that sort of thing. Do I want to shuffle the question order? And you may, or depending upon if you really want things to flow in a specific order, you know, keep it unchecked. Show a link to submit another response. Again, it defaults to being on, but if you want students to only fill out something once, uh, another way to, to kind of hack that in there is to unselect this option there. The confirmation message is purely when after the respondent hits submit, what do they see on the screen? So Google defaults to saying your response has been recorded. Well, that might work most of the time, but I know a lot of teachers who use that as an opportunity to give students their next step. So if they were doing it with as a piece of formative assessment uh, and they were doing it as a bell ringer, they might say, uh, we will begin as soon as everyone is done. Please have uh, your homework out, you know, uh, SSR reading until we're all ready kind of thing and giving their their um directions there so you can change that as needed as well so let's jump into making some questions and i'm going to add some questions in about girl scouts and girl scout cookies here because that's our next step um just as a note some people like to do that set take care of all those settings at the start of their new Google form. Some like to do it when they're getting ready to send it. That's a personal preference in there. Know that I can go back and edit these settings at any time. I can go back to forms I created a year ago and change the settings on them if I need to. Uh, but find, find the workflow that works best for you. So I'm gonna jump down here to my questions. So first, I'm gonna type in a question here. And I'm going to leave it defaulted to this multiple choice, and then we'll talk about some things in there. The first documented sale of, and I'm going to use the abbreviation throughout this, Girl Scout Cookies, uh, took place in Philadelphia, if you didn't know that. Just learned that today. Uh, and I'm going to say in what year, but I'm going to pause real quick, because you can see I now have this suggestions bar. This is a new feature. For Google Forms that it starts to try and recognize what you're writing and then give you um, some options that you can add so if you were saying t-shirt sizes it would automatically start it would say suggestions small medium large anything that are things in a series numbers dates uh, months things like that so you can utilize that or not now I'm gonna finish typing in in what year and uh, it goes away because it realizes it's not applicable. But that smart recognition in there, the autofill, is a newer Google Form feature, and it can be helpful for you. I'm going to put in three different years here. All I have to do is click where it says Option 1, and I'm typing in a date. Then I'm going to add an option and type in. I can add other on uh, any question there that I like if I need to, or I can just make it my four options there. So a few things quickly that I'd like to point out to you. One, when I was typing those in, you might have noticed on any of those, I get this little icon that looks like a, a little picture of mountains. That's because I can use a picture for a question or an answer throughout Google Forms, which is great for non-readers or sometimes if you need a diagram, a map, something like that, you can utilize images. Uh, in order to do that. So a great feature to, to add in there. Uh, I have this little X along the side of my answers on my multiple choice question. I can just hit X to eliminate something. You'll also notice on the left hand side as I hover, I get a, a series of six dots and a, a rectangle here. That means, though, anytime you see those, it means that I can reorder something by clicking it, holding it, and dragging it. You'll also see I have those a series of six dots up at the top here. If I hover over it, I get that four point cursor there. Uh, if I had more than one question and I wanted to reorder them, again, I could drag it uh, to do that. And I'll, I'll reorder one as soon as I add in a second question here. I do have a wide variety of question types. So short answer, great for email addresses, names, phrases, single word answers, things like that. 
Paragraph is for your longer response. Multiple choice is a select one. Check boxes mean somebody can select more than one item on your list. Drop down can be really effective if you have a long list. Sometimes uh, we have folks, if uh, for example, we're selecting uh, what school in their county, uh, what school in the county they're from. We do a drop down with all the names in that county. Instead of having a really long list of options here for multiple choice to condense it. File upload, depending upon your settings, uh, allows students to put in a file that's within your domain only. Uh, right now, my settings, uh, you have to be signed in for that, so that's not going to be an option quite at the moment for this quiz, but it is possible there. A linear scale, you can set a scale of 1 to 4 or 1 to 5 on something, and also set the parameters of what that 1 means versus what that 5 means. And that's uh, I mentioned in the ideas uh, about making rubrics, and that's one of the ways uh, I've seen teachers do that. Multiple choice grid. So if you wanted a, a list of grids, times, or sessions to sign up for, that's a, an option. Date and time as well. So lots of different question types that are available to you. I just happen to use a multiple choice here because when we look at our quiz feature later, um, I need more objective-based questions. Down here along the bottom, I'm going to use that duplicate button in just a second so you can see what that's like. I'm able to trash it. The snowman, which are the three vertical dots we kind of affectionately call the snowman, uh, always means more options in Google. So first, if I needed to, I could show a description and add in some extra information about that question or whatnot there or directions for it. You don't have to, but you can. And then when also in a, an advanced feature is when you start building sections and branching. Um, so if a student or a respondent answers one answers one way, it sends them to another set of questions, or if they answered option B, it sends them to a different set. Things like that. That's definitely uh, an advanced feature and a, a wonderful feature to take uh, take advantage of after you've gained some comfort and familiarity with utilizing Google Forms consistently. Can again, shuffle question or option order here, but depending upon uh, what that information is, you may or may not want to do that. This little required button here is one of my favorite. I'm going to slide it over just by clicking the opposite end so that way it's highlighted. And now this is a required question. So that means the respondent has to answer it before they submit. So I personally, I turn that on almost every question, especially with students, because there would always inevitably be that student who forgot the back side of a page. Oh, I didn't realize it was on, it was two sided. This is kind of the same thing. It almost eliminates that because if they go to respond or, or submit at their form and they haven't answered everything that's required, it doesn't let them. So safeguard there to double check your work. Right now I'm gonna use this duplicate button right here. And what it'll do is it'll duplicate the question before it. You might be thinking, oh, so I don't, I don't want the same question two times. Well, sometimes I do that because it saves all the settings in there. Um, Cause you do have to turn the required part on manually if I had something more extensive. Uh, or in this case, I happen to know I wanna keep that setting. And I know that my next question is also going to be uh, a multiple choice about how many Girl Scout cookies are sold each season. And I know it's gonna have four options in there. So I'm just kind of flubbing, flubbing it and making it a faster way here for me to, to input those answers. Just cause I know that the format is similar to the one before it. Doesn't mean you can't just create a question from scratch in there. You can absolutely 100% do that. But sometimes that duplicate button can uh, save you a little time. See how now I can drag, I have more than one question, and if I'm clicking on a question, I have those little, um, I have the cursor highlights, just drag and drop to reorder in there. If I wanted to make a question from fresh, I'll do that right now. I'm gonna use on this right-hand side, there's this little floating icon button. I'm gonna use that and I'm gonna change this one to a short answer. So you can see I have that short answer text right there built in. I still have 
Uh, the ability to put in a description in there. I'm going to make that. What is your favorite Girl Scout cookie? As we all get hungry. And I'm going to make one more question in there by hitting the plus sign. And I'm going to make that a true or false uh, a question there, but it'll be a multiple choice. I'm just going to make my options true or false. Uh, thin mints and lemonades are vegan. Period. True or false. Wonderful. So you can see as I've gone through, I've got a lot of those same options. I get the uh, picture window over here on that floating panel on the side. I have that add a question. I can add a title or description anywhere. I can, the little, what looks like an equal sign is actually the breaking up of sections. Again, something to do when you're more comfortable uh, or have a, a greater grasp of Google Forms is make those branches off in sections. Add image. And also, this is where the little YouTube button is for me to add a video. If I wanted to do a flipped classroom lesson or something like that, I'd have the ability to uh, add in a video. Students could watch the video and respond to some questions. So I just realized, too, I forgot to hit the required button over. So I'm going to go back, hit the required, hit the required, hit the required. So there we go. Now all of my questions are required. And my self-check is, one, I know that because I see this little red star here, which tells me it's a required question. My other self-check can be using that preview button. Now that we have more in there, it'll make more sense. It'll say up at the top, oh, the ones that are starred are required. And now I can see it there. So I, I it's my little self-check along the way there. So that's kind of, oh, let's talk about sending it. And then we'll move on to our, our intermediate piece here. So when I send a form, one, it's the big send button. And there's a couple different ways that you can send uh, the, the form. So one is to send it directly to folks via email. And that works with a small group. Administrators, if you're, you're on or watching this archive, um, the sending it to your faculty via email is a great way to do it just because it's a small uh, control group in there. You can put the message. And in fact, for that purpose, you could even include the form right embedded right into the email. So great if it's like an RSVP for something. Um, if you have a long list of emails, you might want to split it up into several chunks in there. Um, but it is something that I can do. You'll also see this add collaborators button down here. I want to just draw a distinction between these two things here. So when you're sending this via email, you're sending it for people to respond to. Okay, this collaborators button, uh, add collaborators is what allows you to add in another user to be able to edit this form. So just wanted to make sure that that uh, I drew that distinction. This email share is for people to respond. Collaborators is for uh, folks to help edit. Most often, I personally wind up using the link function uh, in sending a form, and so, so many people do. Uh, you'll see it gives a kind of a long link here. Um, I can click the shorten URL, it'll give me a little bit more of a condensed. And then from there, really, I can also um, make it even shorter by using Google's URL shortener. It's a goo.gl. If you type that into your URL bar, that's address where you can shorten uh, URLs. Uh, you know, I have the ability to do that as well. Um, but most of the time I'm sending folks the link or posting the link on a website, my class website, something like that, gives me the, the option there. And I'm going to mention that when it comes to Google Classroom for my Google Classroom users. So you can post a form in two separate ways in Google Classroom. First and foremost is I could take this link and post it uh, as an announcement or an assignment, whatever your need is there. Question, you can post the, the link directly. Recently, Google Classroom updated to um, that you can attach it directly from your drive. So if you were starting an announcement and you pulled up uh, an assignment, you selected your little drive icon to link to your drive, that's the other way that you can send a form in Google Classroom. So two separate ways, and sometimes that's helpful just in case you're finding one is being a little bit buggy. 
knowing how to backtrack or knowing that there's two options there, I think is sometimes helpful because uh, you always have a backup plan. So either post this link that it gives you or connect directly from your drive. Two awesome options there. I often get asked what these little brackets here are, the last one, send via. And this is for folks, uh, if you do a lot of website editing and things like that, um, it gives you the HTML code to embed it into your website directly. Um, so you are able to do that there. I have tried it, it works. Uh, I just haven't had a lot of occasions where that work, you know, fits in for me. Where that I where I might see that fit in for a teacher, especially if you know uh, how to manipulate HTML um, for something like a book sign out. So it embeds it right in your classroom page, something like that, that people would go back to uh, consistently there. So three options. I far and away use the link option the most, almost exclusively. Every once in a while, I'm using the email. Infrequently to never on the HTML. It might be different for you, and that's totally okay, but I wanted to make sure that all of those were there. So that's how I could send uh, that link out to others. Also, this snowman up at the top gives me a couple uh, more things. It's also a place where I can add in a collaborator. I can also print my form. Truthfully, um, I'm not quite sure why I'd want to print my form. Uh, the beauty of this is that it's all paperless and that you have access to it anywhere. But I also understand that sometimes as educators, we need to have, you know, backup copies of things. So it is there, um, but you don't necessarily need to worry about utilizing it. Sometimes it's just nice knowing that it has that option, even if you never, ever use that option. And that's kind of the, the train of thought I fall into there. It's nice to know that the print exists, but I don't actually really need it. Um, I also have the ability to move it to trash, so I hope you don't, um, unless it's your first one and you're just playing around in there. I want to point out this make a copy. So in the registration form, I did get some questions uh, about uh, making a copy of a form. And or really that when students respond, do they go to different spreadsheets? And we're going to take a look at responses in in just a moment here. Um, you know, you'd like you might be giving the same bell ringer to three different periods. It does not make three different spreadsheets. So one, uh, there's a couple ways that you can, you can handle that situation. So one of those ways is making a copy and then titling your assessment by class period. And I know some folks who do that. Some leave it all as one and then copy or cut and paste the information uh, in the spreadsheet into different tabs. Or what you could do um, in there is make sure that you have those initial questions that are name, date, class period, so then you can use the sort functions in your spread Google Sheets spreadsheet. It works just like Excel, so if you have a little bit of a background knowledge on uh, sorting in Excel, it's exactly the same in a Google Sheet. And that'll give you the ability to, to do that there. So it doesn't innately make multiple spreadsheets. It's a one-to-one -one correlation between forms and the corresponding sheet. But you can kind of hack it uh, by either using this make a copy piece and then titling it so to help keep it organized for you. Or um, you can filter that in the spreadsheet itself afterwards. So two really viable options. And you know, at some point, Google's always updating their platform. So at some point, that might be something uh, I've heard a bunch of teachers ask me that recently. So maybe it's it's something that's on Google's radar as well. And as they update Google Forms, especially on the G Suite for Education platform, could be something that we see uh, in the future. No promises on that one, but I, I definitely have seen more of a demand for that sort of thing. So that's really the basis of our, our ground level of Google Forms. You've got a basic set of questions, you've manipulated your settings, and you've sent it out. That's ground the ground floor. So if you are new to Google Forms, please start with that. Try that with your students. Try that either maybe with some home communication or you're in your school community. That is your main building block. From there, we're gonna take a look at the next level of that. That next level is utilizing that new quiz feature that was new this year. 
Okay, so it's a little step up, and I really do suggest if nothing else, trying at least one or two forms without that quiz feature first, just so that way you know how um, the whole platform kind of works and you can get the kinks out before you have something that's a little more high stakes for you and your students. So I'm going to go back to my settings gear now and select it, and I'm going to go all the way to my last feature, which is quizzes. First thing I'm going to do, slide this over to make it to highlight it and make it a quiz. So I have a couple options here when it comes to making that quiz. When do I want to release the grade? Do I want to release it to students immediately after uh, they they take it? Do I want them to get that instant gratification? Or do I want to turn it on later for manual review? And you'll see turns on email collection. Even if I have that on, I almost always, and I know I said it before, but sometimes things get wonky or funky, I always have a name or student number or initials or something for me to go back to just as a piece of confirmation in case it doesn't work the way I think it's working. So I always know uh, who has filled out that form. And it's just a nice safeguard as much as I use Google and use Google Forms every single day. I like having that that comfort level, that safety net. Um, if you are one of those people too, it will put your mind at ease. And sometimes that's uh, just the best part about it. You're also going to decide what the respondents can see. Can they see missed questions? And anytime, just as you just to note, anytime you see this question mark, if you hover over it, Google says, "I'll explain it to you." That's all it means there. That's what that question mark is. Identify which questions were answered incorrectly. Do I want to identify correct answers to students? Do I want them to see point values? So you have the ability to turn those on and off uh, depending upon what the assessment is there. So you definitely want to take advantage of it and different assessments at different times might require different settings. So I'm going to hit save. So now I've, I've put together my settings how, do, how would Google know which is the correct answer? So we're going to do a little game of pretend here where you, I kind of in a way pretend that you don't see the answers, though you do, and that's okay. Uh, we're teachers here. I'm going to select my first question. I'm going to go back to my questions, and I'm going to select that question. And you're going to see this now says at the bottom, answer key. It did not say it before, so now it's there. So answer key, I can set the points if I want to make it. Five points and I can also by clicking the answer the correct answer select the correct answer on it now just so you know Google Forms currently as it stands today only uh, self grades objective questions so multiple choice true false things like that it doesn't mark short answers or paragraphs the add-on Fluberu does more ro robust uh, marking Again, that one falls into my my advanced folks who might be on this uh, on this webinar this evening. So, uh, you know, get comfortable with this first. Again, building blocks all along the way here. Um, I I have a feeling Google has talked about um, adding in some short answer grading. It has not launched yet, but you can always stay tuned to AOP Tech because we will always update you as soon as those come out. I know lots of teachers are looking forward to that, including Aaron and myself. So we are on the hunt, ready to tweet it out for you when it comes to you there. Uh, so I've selected my correct answer. I can also select my feedback level here. So when I, I don't have to, but I can give students feedback for incorrect answers, I might say, keep going. I might, might be practicing my growth mindset language with my students. Keep going. I can give them a great job for a correct answer in there if I want. This little link button in the bottom left, I can actually direct students to a link if they have something wrong. Send them to a link to view or maybe watch a quick video or read an article about the correct answer there. And all options uh, that depending upon what your objectives are and what you're trying to accomplish may or may not fit, but it's always good to know that the option is there. Uh, when I'm done. I can hit save. You can see here's my feedback, or if I wanted to get rid of it, I could just hit the trash there. 
So I do have to do that with each question that I want to get marked, answer key. I'm gonna set my correct answer, set points if I've turned uh, uh, that there. I'm not gonna put answer feedback there, but I've got it in. You'll notice now when I hit this short answer, I do get the answer key button, but if I open that answer key button, it doesn't say correct answer because it's not going to grade it. I can set the points there, but I have to go back to the responses later and, and add in those points uh, to it. I'm gonna leave it as zero there for right now. I'm gonna say that it says, oop, I gotta hit my answer key first. I'm gonna set this as two points, hit true, because it is, which is very cool, and uh, click away. So now I've done two steps. When I'm making a quiz, there's two separate steps here. So one is setting, using the settings to turn the quiz feature on, and then deciding things like releasing grades or what the respondents can see. Second step of that is, is selecting those correct answers. So you do have to do two separate pieces in there, uh, so that way you can really have it be functional. Again, then you're gonna use that send button at the top. Uh, you can send via email to your students, or that link, again, that link can go to Google Classroom, or you can use the drive connection in Google Classroom to directly correlate that there. And where do the responses go when they're done? Into the responses tab. So I'm actually going to, in just a second here, click over to a Girl Scout quiz with the responses so you can kind of see the difference. Uh, the green sheets button there is how I get to my spreadsheet. I can make uh, a turn off a Google form by saying it's not accepting responses any longer, which is great if you have a due date or a time period or something like that on there. Um, a deadline, helping students keep, keeping students accountable uh, to their uh, deadlines and time management. I can turn that that on and off, not accepting responses, accepting responses. We also have a couple settings under your snowman here. Remember that snowman always means that there's more options there. Uh, do you wanna download the responses in a CSV file? CSV is a type of Excel file or spreadsheet file. You could delete all responses. I hope you don't need to or want to do that at some point, but it is possible that you can kind of wipe the slate clean all at once. You also have the ability to get email notifications for new responses, which can be good or bad. Maybe if it was a parent one, you'd want those notifications on. If it's kids taking an exit ticket, you're gonna wind up with 26 notifications in there. So use it as you need to use it. So I'm gonna flip to my Girl Scout cookies that has responses in here. It's got 44 responses. Uh, I, it'll default, if I open up a new Google form, it'll default to the question side. All I have to do is select where it says responses. And I get a couple things. This, this one, uh, quiz is currently turned off. First I get a summary. This is my overview of the quiz points as it happens. The average was 9 point, almost 9.4 out of 13 points here with the median and the range. I can see on average, what the uh, percent of students who responded correctly were to a question. So that's really helpful, just as a snapshot overview. Let me take a look. Okay, maybe my target was to have nine, at least 90% of students answer this piece of formative assessment quickly, correctly. Well, 82% 80, almost here, that's not bad. It's close to it. So maybe instead of reteaching this whole concept, maybe I don't need to reteach this whole concept to the whole group. Maybe I just need to target certain students as a piece of intervention. Whereas in comparison, the one here is at a 50, 50 almost 57% answer correctly. Well, that's way below my 90 percentile target. And so I have to go back and reteach. So use that summary page really as a place to say, how, how to measure that teaching practice there. Do I need, is this a whole group? Revisit, is this a small group intervention? Both have their time and place there. Um, I can see this Girl Scout cookie, favorite Girl Scout cookies. Remember, that was an ungraded one. Uh, and depending upon how people spelled it or uh, spelled the response or capitalized, you'll get different ones. Though in this case, Thin Mints was the clear winner, uh, if, if you were curious as to that. Teachers do love Thin Mints, as do I. Um, and again, 81 percentile here. So that just gives me 
an overview. Then by selecting the individual tab, I can see each person's individual response. So I can see that um, this question was correct. I've got five out of five points. This one was incorrect, but maybe if students gave something partial, you know, I can give them an extra point or two. And you'll see it says edits are pending, save. Maybe I gave that student an extra point because that student came to me after and said, you know what, I really read that question wrong. And, you know, I know the correct answer and this is it. Things like that. I also have the ability to add in individual feedback for a student for any question there. And say thin mints, I'm going to give you three points for thin mints and save. So I'm able to, to go back and edit uh, those in there. I can also delete a response or print a response. Maybe you need some backup for you know an IEP meeting or something like that. You can take that along with you. I'm going to click open to review the responses in a spreadsheet format now. So as you can see, um, any Google form has this correlating spreadsheet. And it doesn't matter once it's open. Once you've created that, when anyone fills in a Google form, even in real time, and you have this sheets open next to it, it will populate into that sheet. Um, it is auto updating. The two are tied together. Um, so, you know, you could put something out there um, for two weeks and it will continuously auto populate. It's not a new spreadsheet every time. It gets added onto the same one. So you don't have 17,000 spreadsheets with 17,000 different things on there. Um, I am able to see here the timestamp of when it was created um, or when it was submitted uh, can be helpful, especially if you're curious at when students might be submitting things to you from home. Um, I, this was an anonymous quiz, but if I had a name feature here, it would be there. I do have the score. Um, and again, that doesn't add in the, the open-ended question there. How many, and I can see across the board. So if I were looking, you know, I could say like, oh, you know what, there's a student I need to target for intervention. That question was wrong. We almost all had it right, but I have just a handful of students that aren't, I'm going to work with just those students on that concept since we were pretty close to that 90 percentile or whatever your threshold you're uh, sharing there. Just as a note, you can see that these cells are tiny. Um, just like in Excel, this is an Excel trick I learned, you know, a years ago um, using Excel, but has the ability, if you just hover on the uh, line, in this case, the dividing line between cells C and D, double click, it'll open it out to the full text there. So two things, I, two, a reason I bring that up there is one, because you might want to expand it out so you see that full full question. If that's kind of the organization, it does make it a little longer, but perfectly up to you. The other piece of that is um, if you have students filling out a paragraph response, it's going to get filtered into a cell. Well, cells aren't very large, so I have two options. Either I can expand it out, which might make it a bit of a bulky for a Google spreadsheet there, but I can also, by going over this uh, column E, what is your favorite Girl Scout cookie? You can see the question is cut off there. But if I select that box up here in the FX line, um, I have the full question. So that would be probably my preferred way personally that if I were reading a longer response to a, a question here, something that was more paragraph-like, instead of opening it up uh, by double-clicking over, which you can do if that works for you, but I can also select that box and then be able to read the full response in in that line there. Or I could do so by going to the individual page of that, that student's uh, quiz there. And if I were using a form that wasn't a quiz, you wouldn't see any of these things like points, but you'd still get a, a view um, and some analytics uh, on that summary. I'd still have the ability to uh, see a summary. It would just be pie charts instead of these kind of uh, percentile graphs here. So you're still getting that, still the ability to view the responses in sheets, um, even if it's something that's not graded, like a quiz feature there. So that gives us our, our two big levels of Google Forms there. And I would also include uh, in the future, and if you have questions about it, feel free to reach out to Aaron and I about branching 
or setting up those different sections. Not really the, the objective we have today uh, in terms of talking about formative assessment, but definitely something that's available there. So if you do have questions about that in the future, feel free to reach out to Aaron and I uh, about that. So the last piece that, that I want to talk about here for my advanced folks. My folks, you, you have been using Google Forms for quite a bit, are add-ons. And literally, if you don't know what an add-on is, it's um, a function that you add on to that Google tool. So what Google recognized is that the way I might use uh, Google Forms could differ from the way you use Google Forms. And that's a wonderful thing. And so instead of trying to build every feature and every tool into their form, um, they have outside companies, it's an, it's an open thing, are able to build these add-ons. And you can literally add an add-on to your experience. So if I wanted to do so, I'm going to come up here to my one form, click back to questions. If I didn't have any add-ons at all, where I'm going to go is the snowman in the top right. And I'm going to drop down to that very last feature, add-ons, there. So by selecting the add-ons there, I can, and you can see the couple that I have in, uh, loaded in because they have little green check marks. Um, they're add-ons that I'm able to add on. So if I didn't have any uh, GMAF, I'm going to talk about some in just a moment here, are a good one. I'm going to pick one that I don't have, uh, this form publisher, and form publisher turns Google Form submissions into docs, sheets, slides, and PDFs. So maybe I needed to do that. If I'm going to add an add-on, I'm going to select it from that menu. You can see here, it's a little plus sign in the top right. I'm going to select it. And what it's going to do is going to bring me a dialog box that says that that add-on, Form Publisher, would, would like to connect with my account. You have to allow it in order for it to do it. So I'm going to say allow. And then if I didn't have a puzzle piece, oh, it popped up my uh, notification that it added in. If I didn't have the puzzle piece before, you would now have that puzzle piece. And uh, if you do, it'll just add it onto the list. So the, here are all the add-ons I have specifically for Google Forms. And there are add-ons for Google Docs, for Slides, just about anything in the uh, platform. So that way you can personalize your experience. And each of them have their own set of kind of um, directions and whatnot with them, things you have to do or set up. Um, so utilize them as you, as you need them there. Uh, so there's a, a whole ton of, sorry, there I am, uh, a ton of different add-ons for various features there. And they're definitely a, a level of comfort when it comes to using add-ons. A few I'd like to highlight, Fluberoo. I mentioned that uh, the quiz feature doesn't grade things like short answers or keywords, things like that. Fluberoo is a tool that um, does a little bit more robust self-grading in there. GMath for my math teachers. I definitely had a question about that on the registration form. What are my math class ideas? Well, you've got surveys and charts and graphing and sorting that you can do with a Google form. Maybe even helping students to fulfill that communicating mathematically piece in there. But one of the great ones is the GMath for forms. And it helps you to make math expressions or graphs. Definitely middle school on up focus. Um, but a fantastic add-on and tool in there. Choice Eliminator, uh, Form Recycler. These are all links in here for my advanced folks. Uh, I included as well one, a, a link to Aaron's Pinterest. Who's, he's got a whole bunch of um, pieces on advanced users for forms and add-ons. Uh, a link here to five great Google Forms and Sheets add-ons for teachers. Let me get rid of this pop-up here. There we go. Uh, and I'll get rid of this. There we are. So Choice Eliminator is one of them. Formula. Autocrat um, sends out certificates when people fill it out automatically, things like that. You'll see Fluberoo on just about every, every list there. And then another one that has um, great G Suite add-ons for teachers. So not exclusive to Google Forms, um, but for anything in that platform there. So the ability to do that. So there's tons and tons of 
options for teachers to really customize and enhance their experience. So with that, we're going to conclude our webinar today. Um, so much we've talked about. We've talked about three different levels and building blocks to Google Forms and ways that you can really utilize that in your classroom to the best of, of your abilities and needs there. And that's always what I come back to about Google Forms is the ability to customize a form based on what my need or my students need are at any given time. It is one of the most versatile tools in your teacher uh, technology toolbox. Truthfully, I use it for so much. Um, so, a few things that, to wrap us up for this evening here. Uh, one, follow AOP Tech. We are on Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, and Instagram, as well as YouTube, where our webinar archives are hosted. Uh, feel free to connect with us that way. We love sending out things about the latest updates for if there were a Google Forms update. We're definitely going to put that on our Twitter. So make sure that you're you're following us there, as well as our website, aoptech.weebly.com. That's also uh, where our registrations are uh, hosted there. And I'll give a quick shout out to EdCamp AOP, which is the 25th of February. If you haven't registered yet, there's more information about that on the on our aoptech.weebly.com website. Uh, so quick shout out. Thanks for letting me give that commercial there. But it's a way to connect with us. As always as well, feel free to reach out to either Aaron or myself. Right here I have our email addresses as well as our uh, Twitter handles. Please reach out to us. One, we love sharing about what you're doing in your classroom, particularly on Twitter. We love to retweet things from your classroom, especially if you have a class or school Twitter there. So connect with us. Also, uh, we are happy to help you in your Google Forms, your G Suite for Education journey, um, and anything ed tech uh, along the way there. That's what Aaron and I are here for. We're here to help you and support you in any way that we can. So please don't hesitate to reach out to either of us when you have questions. Uh, so with that, I hope you have a wonderful evening. And I hope that you use Google Forms in your classrooms very soon. Thanks, everyone.